Welcome to Bloomberg Law on Demand. I'm Lee Pacquia. The human suffering caused by the events in Japan makes it hard to think about the economic impact. However, the recovery is sure to have an effect on insurance and reinsurance markets. Randy Parr, a partner at the law firm Kazowitz, Benson, Torres, and Friedman, joins me now to discuss. Randy, thanks so much for coming in today. Welcome Thank you to the for program. Me come in. Thank you. I realize it's hard to generalize in situations like this, but still, if you could kind of give us some idea as to the scale of, of, of the losses uh, affected out of the, uh, the disaster, what are we looking at here? Is it truly as unprecedented as the media suggests? Well, there, there have been attempts to estimate the losses. No one really knows yet. There are various modeling companies who have come forward with losses somewhere between 200 and 300 billion dollars. Mm -hmm. right, Bloomberg had an article out today that said it was roughly Katrina times four. I think that that's right. The difference is, is you have two issues. One is, at least for me, given my insurance orientation, one is the size of the loss and how much of it is insured. And in fact, when you compare it to Katrina, I think you will find that a far smaller percentage of the Japanese loss is insured with the insurance market. And so that it may in fact be that more money was paid out under Katrina than will be paid out under the Japanese situation. Interesting. So, so let's break this down. We have damage resulting from the earthquake. We have damage resulting from the tsunami. And we have damage resulting from the release of radiation from the Fukushima nuclear power plant. Mm -hmm. What under those are, are covered and what's not? Well, it's interesting because there are even more, more issues than that, more perils. Certainly, there's a lot of fire that caused loss, and so that is an, an addition. Because of the contamination at the nuclear power plant, orders of civil authority have prevented people from going back in and starting their businesses again. So there are many, many causes. And in fact, from an insurance standpoint, what is interesting and what will be critical is trying to figure out what is the actual cause of what amount of loss? Because mm -hmm. fire is covered under, under policies. Earthquake and tsunami is usually there is a sublimit. So although a company may have a, an insurance program of $500 million, not uncommon, the, the loss covered for a um, earthquake loss in Japan may be only 50 million. So you have to look at that. Then you have the nuclear exclusion problem. And nuclear uh, perils are not covered under most general liability policies, or most property policies, really, excuse me. And so one of the struggles that's going to happen in the insurance world as these claims begin to mature is the insurance companies and the policyholders arguing about what is the actual cause of the specific loss. Mm -hmm. I want to focus on the nuclear aspect for a moment. The damages from the, the events at the Fukushima power plant seem to be increasing uh, as time goes on. We're into this 14 days now, I think. If it's not covered under insurance, how is, are the damages and the losses going to be paid for? Is that something that the Japanese taxpayer is ultimately going to be responsible for? Well, ultimately, for? A, a huge percentage of the loss caused by these events are going to be borne by the Japanese individually. Mm -hmm. um, just in terms of the amount of insurance is not there. Uh, most policies do not provide any insurance for nuclear contamination. But what the nuclear problems will cause is a delay in Japan getting back into business. And what that does in the world of insurance is called uh, um, lengthening the period of indemnity, which means the amount of the business interruption loss will increase. Mm. Re real quickly, I know this isn't necessarily your area of expertise, but on the regulation side, after Chernobyl happened, uh, there was a kind of a global effort to rethink the way um, uh, nuclear power vendors uh, are liable right. uh, for their accidents. Do you expect something similar to emanate out of this episode? Well, I don't know. Before this episode, certainly at least I felt a movement in this country being much more tolerant towards nuclear mm. power. I think a lot um, of people would agree with that. And I think that now everyone is rethinking that position. Uh, so I. In many respects, and I think in Japan as well, there are laws which, which prevent liability or limit liability from a provider of nuclear power. So I think people are going to rethink that. However, a company like Japan, who doesn't have any local energy source other than nuclear, right. how are they going to import the amount of power and energy which they're going to need to rebuild the northern part of their country? No, there's, there's going to be far-reaching effects, no doubt. I um, wanted to talk to you a little bit about the claim landscape at this time. It's early days. But what are we starting to see? Has volume picked up? Well, what you're seeing is a lot of companies putting in a claim with their insurers, which are sort of uh, bare bones, that don't have the details of the amount of the loss or do not attribute the cause of the loss, for very good reasons that they just don't know it yet. Mm -hmm. When you talk about business interruption, which is going to be a huge portion of the loss, those losses are only beginning to occur now.
We talk about a disruption in the, in the supply chain to a U.S. manufacturer. They're only now beginning to shut down plants, reduce production, because they cannot get their supplies from Japan if they're, if they're manufactured there. So no one really knows the scope of the law. So what policyholders are doing are putting in the letter, giving their, policy, giving their insurance company notice, and then they'll just supplement that with more detail. So you're right. seeing a lot of notice come in. Right. Business inter interruption is obviously a, a big part of the puzzle here, yes. especially for American companies. Mm -hmm. um, what should they be doing at this time other than filing a claim? Is there anything that they can do other than wait and see? Well, they have to, they're probably um, hustling now to find alternative sources for the supplies, which they now can't get from Japan. I think what's one of that issue is going to be in the future buying insurance for years thereafter. Companies, I think, are going to look far more as to how tied are they to a Japanese supply source, what alternatives are there in case something like this happens, looking at other areas of the world where they are doing business and where there's an earthquake risk. Mm -hmm. Because of globalization, all of this has an impact far beyond uh, what has happened before. Right. J just out of curiosity, which industries are affected most? I know immediately everyone here at Bloomberg looked to uh, electronics manu mm -hmm. parts manufacturers as being uh, impacted by the disaster. What else? We're also starting to see potentially food sources. Um, food sources. Also, I think automobile manufacturers have a lot of source sourcing out of Japan. So I think that some automobile manufacturers have cut back in production and I think in one, at least one instance have shut down a plant. Uh, because they just don't can't get the material they need to make. In terms of, of food, I have a number of clients in the food industry, and the flip side is that Japan is no longer going to be able to export food produce because of the fear of radiation. So it opens up markets to U.S. manufacturers, mm -hmm. uh, which they may not have ha had before. And I would imagine that's going to have a big impact on food inflation. We've seen food prices just Could going through well. the roof over the last Absolutely. two months. I uh, want to touch on uh, the issue of uh, facing reinsurers. We've had a number of companies Mm -hmm. Hanover Re, Swiss Re, um, come out and say they are, expect earnings to be impacted by uh, these events. What should we be looking at there? Are the numbers as bad as, as they're anticipating, or do you expect them to get worse? I don't think the numbers actually will get worse. I think in terms of a chicken little, the sky is falling. People talk about the huge amount of the loss, which, which is enormous. but. A very small percentage of that loss, maybe 15 percent, maybe 20, is actually covered by insurance. So as I mentioned earlier, you may have less of a payout in this situation than you did under Katrina. Partly for cultural reasons, the Japanese don't insure as much as we insure. They insure mostly locally with local um, Japanese insurers. Now that eventually hits the reinsurance market because mm -hmm. those losses are then reinsured in, in that market. So there is going to be an impact, but we don't yet know the size of that impact. Mm -hmm. Just in closing, I wonder uh, what people in, in your profession are saying uh, or keeping their eyes on uh, as the single most important aspect. There's a lot, of, there's a lot moving around in this situation right. between the earthquake, the fire, the right. tsunami, uh, and now the, the nuclear issue. What are, what are the people that you talk to looking at? Well, I think most. in terms of, of lawyers who are going to be involved in the litigation that, that will undoubtedly mm -hmm. ensue, we're looking at, at the causation questions because that will really determine how much insurance there is or whether or not there is, in fact, any insurance. Um, so I think that that is probably, from my standpoint, something that I'm concerned about. On a going forward basis, I'm looking at how are the insurance policies going to change as a result of this uh, catastrophe because how the policies are written will impact how much insurance you can get under a policy or whether or not it's excluded. So that is important for me prospectively. All right. Well, we'll have to see how it goes. Randy, I want to thank you so much thank for coming for in today. Thank you for letting me come. Thank you. That's Randy Parr. She's a partner at the law firm Kazwitz Benson based here in New York City. If you'd like to learn more about the issues we just discussed, go check out our offerings on BloombergLaw.com and also on the Bloomberg Terminal. I'm Lee Pacquia. Thanks for watching.